Hello guys, you're welcome back to Labby Premium Consult. In today's video, as you can see on your screen, we are going to continue with our past question discussion from University of Professional Studies, Introduction to Business Finance. So if you are new on this channel, kindly make sure to subscribe to the channel, make sure to hit the like button and then share with your friends and everyone so that they can also get benefit to learn on this channel. So without wasting my time, let's move straight away to our question for today. So question 21. So I read, an investment should be rejected if the net present the net present value is dash and accepted if it is. I read again, an investment should be rejected. So the line word where it should be what? Rejected if the net present value is dash and accepted if it is so NPV is one of the key methods for appraising investment when it comes to capital strategy decisions when it comes to capital strategy decisions how or in your know, investment processes when business want to undertake an investment and they want to find how what the investment will be valued the returns and the cost NPV is one of the methods that they use to I mean do the calculations and then arrive at a decision. So the decision rule, the decision rule for net present value as NPV is saying that an investment should be accepted if the outcome is greater than zero or is what positive. Positive. But then it should be rejected. But then it should be rejected if it is less than zero or negative. That is the rule when it comes to NPV in terms of decision making in relation to investment. So here in this case, we can conclude that therefore option D holds best for the rule for net present value. I hope that is clear. So net present value, we are talking about what the discounted of future cash flows into present terms. The discounted of future cash flows to present terms. So in that we have what we call discounted payback in terms of value, in terms of what, the period. So as we move along, we get to understand deeper when it comes to net present value in relation to discounted what, future cash flows. So net present, we are talking about the discounted future cash flows into present terms. If you want to undertake an investment, what is the present value of that investment now that you want to undertake for let's say five years to come? What is the present value now? With that, once you're able to do the calculations for net present value you get to know that okay this investment should be selected because it returns going to be this and the cost going to be that and then you are good to go or it should be rejected because of this and that so that is the way when it comes to an investment appraiser an investment appraiser i hope that is clear so let's take note of so here option d holds best for our choice option d holds best for our choice so that is d so let's move so it should be rejected if it is negative and accepted if it is what positive so d is true let's move on to question 22. question 22. one will be indifferent taking and not taking the investment when i read again one will be indifferent between taking and not taking the investment when a the net present value is greater than zero B, the net present value is equal to zero. C, the net present value is less than zero. Or the given options above. I mean, when it comes to investment decision here, this question is on two sides of the coin. It's talking about those who may accept an investment based on the decision rule for NPV. Or people who may not accept an investment also based on the decision rule for NPV. So people will accept or an entity or individual will accept an investment project to engage on if one it is positive and is greater than what zero and an individual will not accept an investment if the net present value is less than zero or it is what negative so in that case that person wouldn't what or that entity wouldn't accept that investment or it can also be equal to what zero so i mean all the options here will actually speak for various what parties in this question 
actually here it is two sides of the coin it's talking about those who accept and those who won't accept based on decision rule that's the indifference that we are talking about an entity or a business wouldn't be certain if these conditions are actually presented to them so that is the rule okay so they will be indifferent in different year we are talking about whether they will accept it or they won't what accept it. that's why between taking and not taking what an investment and do, and we can clearly see that all the options here satisfies it so all the above options are true whether it's equal to zero whether it's less than zero or it is greater than what zero so let's take note of that i hope that is clear i hope that is clear so let's take note of that so if you are really enjoying this video you know what to do comment below in the comment section make sure to hit the like button please hit the like it's very important to me please and please hit the like button for me so that we can engage on them get more wider audience to assist them so let's move on so that becomes what all the options all of the options all of the given notes options all of the given options so let's take note of that i hope that is clear so let's move on to question 23 adams incorporation has the following data we have risk free rate so let me make it as what rf risk free rate as what five percent okay market risk premium i'll call it as m r m r market risk premium is also what six percent and beta is equal to one point zero five what is the firm cost of equity based on the camp so camp actually we are talking about cap capital asset pricing model so with a camp you are talking about capital asset pricing model it's also another model that we use to estimate the cost of equity estimate the cost of equity so if you are to estimate the cost of equity using the camp method generally the industrial standard for an entity to be measured on on the level of beta base to determine the risk of an investment should be what one general that is the industrial what standard that if you want to measure any investment based on beta then you should be what equal to one so if you have any beta that is greater than one meaning that that investment the risk level attached to that investment is very what high and therefore so it requires you to make a decision whether you are to finance your business based on I mean whether you have to finance your business based on that source i mean the cost will determine based on i mean your cost will determine i mean the cost will determine and you you know a decision you're going to take so that is something that you need to know beta i mean tell us the riskiness of what an investment so for the industrial level the standard should be what one so if you have beta greater than one mean that that investment that you are undertaking or that source you want to use to finance your business have high what risk there's a probability that you may gain or you may what lose the the level of gaining or losing is very well high so that is something about beta it determines the riskiness of an investment or a particular source to finance the activities of the business so in using come to estimate the cost of equity the formula is equal to always your risk free rate risk free rate more like what treasury bill that's the risk free rate investment i mean i receive a risk free rate uh, form of what financial instrument doesn't there is no default i mean when it comes to treasury bill the probability that you get your money is high there is no default in your money being locked up that's why once you hear of risk free rate an example of risk free rate is our is treasury bills so treasury bills is also part of the risk free rate that you can think of so using the count in determining the cost of equity it is equal to risk free rate plus your risk premium multiply by the beta and risk premium risk premium is equal to your returns on the market minus returns on the market minus risk free rate so this is how we determine risk premium 
return on the market minus with you. But here, in a question we have been should I be giving what the market risk premium? So there is no need to go by this. I hope that is clear. So straight away, I can say that therefore my cost of equity KE is going to be so I know my risk free rate as well, 5%, so 0.05. Plus, I know my risk premium to what? 6%, so 0.06%. So multiply by, I know my beta to be 1.05. So at the end of the day, with your help of calculator, you should be able to arrive at 11, 11, or let's say, sorry, 0. 0.113 so when you want to change to percentage it also becomes so in percentage going to be 11.3 percent or 30 percent so this is why you need to get when it comes to determine the cost of equity using what the camp capital asset pricing model approach so it's going to be 11 percent i hope that is clear so it's always your risk free rates plus your risk premium multiplied by the beta your risk premium will multiply by the beta, but then risk premium is your returns on the market compared with your risk free rate. That is how we determine risk premium. You compare the returns on the market as against your returns from risk free rate. I mean, risk free rate return. Based on the two, you can determine that this form of source or investment I want to undertake in this venture has, let's say, a risk premium or I mean below a discounted what premium i mean a discounted value sorry it can be risk where your market returns on market is greater than your risk free rate that's where it becomes a risk premium but if your market returns on the market is less than your risk free rate then there's not a risk premium so let's take note of that so here is going to be what the answer is going to be what a as 11.30 percent so let's take note of that so let's move on to question 24 you have been giving some information out here use the following to answer question 24 and 25 use the following to answer questions 24 and 25 now let's read john plans to open a service center the equipment will cost fifty thousand dollars john expects the after tax cash inflows to be $15,000 annually for what, 8 years, after which he plans to scrap the equipment and retire. I read again, John plans to open a service center. The equipment will cost $50,000. John expects the after tax cash inflows to be $15,000 annually for 8 years after which he plans to scrap the equipment and retire. Question 24. What is the project's regular payback period? What is the project's regular payback period? So payback period is one of the methods for investment appraisal. It's one of the methods that we use to appraise investment, whether we are to accept an investment or we shouldn't accept a particular investment project. So payback period is saying that, hey, when it comes to determining whether an investment is worth it to accept it or not, all that we need to understand is that the streams of future cash flows, if the streams of future cash flow going to derive based on the stipulated time period, right, is able to pay off the initial cost at a faster time or at a shorter period of time, then such investment needs to be accepted but any investment that would take a longer period of time for us to recover the initial cost then such investment shouldn't be what accepted get it right when it comes to payback period the approach here is that hey in determining the payback period it is saying that it's a method that we use to appraise investment it is saying that for payback period an investment should be accepted if the period needed to recover the initial cost is shorter but then should be rejected if it is hot longer so this is how payback period works all that you need to do 
is to accumulate i mean the streams of future cash flows right that will result to the initial cost being zero to what zero okay that's what what paper period talks about so at what period should we accumulate that the total amount from the streams of that cash flow will be equal to the initial cost at that period is what we call the payback period it's what we call the payback so let's put them in a more practical so that you understand what i'm saying much more better so in this case the number of years that we should have extremes of fifteen thousand dollars to flow regularly is what eight years i mean it's eight years the number is what eight years so this is what you're going to do first you need to tell us about the years okay then you tell us about the net cash flow so let me use this to shorten it net cash flow net cash flow all right and then i can also think of okay so let's use these two for now so here i'll have a start from zero one two three four five six seven eight okay and at zero period it is what that is the initial varied to be what fifty thousand dollars that was the initial cost of the equipment so in that sense so far as i've placed 50 year i'll place here my dollars with what three zeros is that okay to indicate the fifty thousand dollars i'm having so because i've placed it three zeros is going to affect all the values below so let's take note of that so now this 50 is a negative what value so that's why i put them in brackets sorry in brackets so meaning that the streams of income that we need to receive regularly for the eight year period is to be what fifteen thousand dollars so it's going to be 15 for first year 15 for second year 15 for third year 15 for fourth year fifth year six seven and what sorry and eighth is that okay so here now what are the accumulated future cash flows from this period that will when we add or it can clear off or recover the initial cost of john's what service center is plan of opening it it's an investment going to undertake but we need to do these work calculations before he can determine whether it is worth for him to accept that investment or go into that investment or not these are the reason why we engage on these what appraisal what methods and to do proper calculations to verify to see whether that investment is worth it or not so here this is what we're going to do now if i should take the first streams of income of what, fifteen thousand for year one for year one for year one meaning that if i subtract fifteen thousand from fifty i'm left with what thirty five so that's going to be what 35 i believe that is clear then year two take fifteen thousand from 35 i'm left with what i'm left with 20. i believe that is clear i'm left with what 20. then we want to year three 15 from 20 i'm left with what five so meaning that roughly we can say that from year one, year one to year two and year three is a first year, so it's a constant year. So we have the three written down. I hope that is clear. So we are left with just five of the streams of the future cash flow that we can add up. So we're taking from the initial cost so that we can get to the total of what fifty thousand dollars. So this is what you're going to do because we cannot allocate the whole of what. 15,000 in year four, in year four, to the cost of the equipment. All that we need to do is to consider the amount left that we need to add up to the three. Because here is 15, 15, 15. I mean, the three, this one, 15. So making it what 45, and in so doing, we are left with five to be added to the 45. That will be the accumulation, and then. We subtract from the initial cause and we get it but then here our focus is on how to determine the period 
a period that we can recover the initial cost that is why of is important to us so that's why we need to determine i hope that is clear so in this case in doing that how or uh, let's say on what period are we going to what paid or receive these five streams of what income to recover the initial cost that is why we are interested at what period so in this case here you're going to find the proportion of that period streams of income that is what year four so year four the streams of income was what fifteen thousand is that okay so in this case for you to determine the period for year four based on the five dollars that five thousand dollars left this is what you're going to do they're going to tell us that you're going to find a proportion of the five as against the 15 right and then multiply by what so year four is what one yes one year i hope that is clear so in this case it's going to result to three out of sorry it's going to result to one out of what three or better still somebody might do in this way let's say here is five out of what 15 and you want to use the month so you're going to multiply with what 12 months so in this case it's going to be four months is that okay four months and the person is good to what go so mean that roughly we have three years right that is first year second year and third year together with what four months that we can recover our initial what cost and this is what we call the payback period so we see we accumulate all the streams of future cash flows from these years right that we were able to what recover the initial cost quickly quickly so on that on that in, on that note we can say that the period or the payback period is three years three years and four what, four months so on that we can say that payback period for this project or this investment is going to be what three years four months three years four months so three years four months so if you want to convert all of them to years we can say that is what we are going to add three years plus one over three so it's going to result to a 10 over what three so it's going to be three whole number one over three and remember here the options here were given in decimal so we can safely say that is what 3.333 remember the three is already occurring when you divide one over three it's going to be 0 0.3333 so you shorten it to two decimal place and that's going to be so here 24 the option is what options what c option c is the right answer so 3.33 years that's the payback period that we can the period that we will go through for us to recover the initial cost of the equipment so that is a payback period that is the payback period so to john you're going to make a decision based on this calculation and then that is that so that is payback period actually that is payback period so let's take note of that now let's move to question 25 we are using the same information to actually work on so let's take note of that now question 25 assuming the required return is 10 percent what is the project discounted payback period assuming assuming the required return is 10 percent what is the project discounted payback period remember payback period it just consider what the period that we will recover our initial cost of the equipment it doesn't take into account time value of money doesn't value time but discounted period take into account the period upon which we're going to recover our initial cost and also takes into account time value of money so actually the payback period is actually simple to calculate and get it right but then the major drawback on payback period is that it doesn't take into account time value of money but with payback period there are certain things that it won't take into consideration but then with discounted payback period it becomes just an improvement a little bit improvement to the payback period which add up the drawbacks that payback actually couldn't able to fulfill and then it takes it into itself to engage in that so that is the discounted payback period it takes into account time value of money and then also the period upon which we can recover the initial cost of 
or investment i believe that is clear so let's move on to the calculation side we are asked to calculate a discounted pay back period how do you do that so in this case this is what you're going to do in this case this is what you're going to do let's see what i can clean part of uh, the issue here so that i can we can work on the discounted payback period discounted payback period so let's see let's see so with the discounted payback period the whole idea is that here we need to discount the streams of future cash flows into their present terms we need to find out you say you want to engage in that investment what is the present value now of that invest or that future investment that you want to undertake what is the present value now so once you're able to know the present value now then it will actually inform you whether you should accept it or not so with the pay, discounted payback period it is saying that hey for us to accept any investment decision whether you should accept it or reject it it is based on the total accumulation of the discounted or the net present values of these future cash flows if the net present value of these future cash flows is positive and greater than zero then we need to accept it if it is negative we shouldn't what, accept it that is a discounted payback so the discounted payback period actually works with what the net present value they help us to discount future cash flows into present terms so once you're able to discount future cash flow into present terms we will be able to know the value of the investment now as against tomorrow that we're going to receive it was inflows of what income or cash flows i hope that is clear so let's engage on the calculation so with the calculation all that we're going to do is going to discount the fifteen thousand dollars from year one to year eight we're going to discount all of them so when we discount all of them upon calculation or upon accumulation of the discounted or upon accumulation of the discounted feature cash flows of this what period when we accumulate them together when we sum them together at the level where the summation of these discounted feature cash flows equals to the initial cost of the equipment that is where we can determine our discounted payback period i take it again when it comes to the discounted payback period we are saying that hey it is the discounted of what future cash flows the summation of the discounted of future cash flows at the period where the summation of the discounted future cash flows is able to recover our initial cost that is the period for discounted payback period let's put them into practice i think with that you're able to understand it better so this is what you're going to do you are going to find out what the discounted payback period for discounted i mean value for these streams of what future cash flow so with the 15 first year this is what we're going to do so in that we're going to use a formula called a compounding formula that's what we're going to use to discount these streams of what future what cash flows i hope that is clear so this is a formula in discounting so you can it will tell us that the net present value or the present value is going to be your future value okay divided by your future value factor one plus r to the power of what n these are going to use so here feature value subscript n it will depends on the period that we are discounting okay and then the r is the number of period so this is what we're going to do so for first year our present value for first year that's pv1 is going to be 15 15 yeah so because we have the zero so let's use the 15 15 all divided by one and i know the cost of the investment is what 10 percent so it's going to be what 0 0.1 okay and i know the year that i'm actually discounting so year one so one so with this you should be able to get so with my case i had present value for year one to be 13 thousand sorry 13 point so what three so mean that's what 13 thousand six hundred and thirty what dollars because of the three zeros at the top here so let's take a note of that so that is for year one so you're going to do same for year two year three and year four and keeps on on and on so you can say let's say pv for year two so it's going to be what 15 divided by one plus what 0 
okay and all to the power of what two that is n and with that two i had i want to what 12.40 i converted them to what two decimal places so you should be able to do that and then you continue on and on to do for what year three and up to the various what years two so year three two is going to be 15 out of one so it's going to be what 1.1 right out to the power of three and then you should be able to get i had my case i had 11.27 so let me go on to what year four that's present value for pv4 present value for year four I mean the discounted net present value for year 4 is going to be 15 divided by 1.1 1 .1 or to the power of 4 and with that I also had mine to be 10.25 so when you discount all the future cash flows from this investment then when you sum them up at the period where the summation of right from year one to that period and is equal to the initial cost that becomes a discounted payback period so let's do some summation and see so i have a 13.63 so when i added 13.63 plus 12.4 plus 11.27 plus 10.25 47 so up to year 4 my total summation up to year 4 that is p v1 plus p v2 3 dots plus p v4 i had the total net present value to be 47.55 so meaning that we are left with what 2.45 as a discounted value we need to add up to the 47.55 to arrive at what the initial cost of the as a initial cost of the equipment to what 50. so in that too this is what you're going to do so meaning that here we have four years as a first word year there so we are left with just 2.45 so the next thing we're going to do is to find a proportion of the discounted word Future cash flow from what year five. So year five we have what fifteen. So that one we're going to discount it. So with that two, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to tell us that our P present value for year five is going to be fifteen divided by one point one to the power of five. And with my case, I had that one to be nine point what. 3 words 1 9.31 so as we did for that of the regular, uh, regular payback period you're going to do the same for the discounted payback period so mean that we are left with just what 2.45 to be added up to what the 47.55 for us to get what the initial cost of what 50 and we ought so at that period that will recover our that period we'll be able to discount the future cash flows and their summation that period we're going to determine our discounted payback what i mean per the name you should be able to know that discounted payback we are talking about the summation of what discounted what future cash flows when we sum all the all of them up the period at which the summation were able to help us to recover the initial cost or recoup the initial cost of that investment hence hence will determine the discounted payback what period so here it's going to be we're going to find a proportion right so it's going to be 2.45 okay as the remaining to be added to the 47.5 to get what 50 divided by the discounted value for the fifth year and then multiply by what you can say multiply by 12 months or multiply by what one so with my case on that i had my answer to be in terms of years i had it to be zero point what to six years so in that case therefore i can say that my discounted payback period is going to be four plus zero point what two six you know we, we did same for when we we're doing the payback period where we we're left with what five where we are left with the five where we divide by 15 and multiply by one if you can remember 
So same thing also doing here. So always find a proportion of what's left to be added to the discounted payback to recoup the initial cost. I mean, we find a proportion and then we know the time that we can pay that what value to get our period. I mean, the period is important to us. So here is going to be 4.26 what years and that's going to be option what a for that matter. So let's take note. I hope you are getting what I'm teaching. If you have any question, put in the comment section, I'll answer you right away. So if you are getting values out of this, make sure to smash the like button, okay? Please smash the like button, it's very important to me. And subscribe to the channel if you have forgot to subscribe. So that at any time we release out any video, once you subscribe, turn up the notification bell on. So at any time we release any new video, you'll be the first person to get it on your device. So let's move on, smash the like button and then let's take it from there. So thank you once thank you once again for still being with me at this time. I'm grateful for your time. So let's continue. Question 26. On the income statement, sales revenue minus cost of goods sold and operating expenses equals so on the statement of comprehensive income, okay. Your sales revenue. When you take your sales revenue, all right, and you take into account your cost of sales right or cost of goods sold or cost of sales and then plus your operating what expenses when you take the cost of sales and operating expenses from your sales revenue we are saying that you should be able to arrive at your net profit before net profit before what interest that's earnings before interest before interest and what tax you see ebit so that becomes your net profit is it's waited for tax and interest to, to be deducted so when you do that let's see they are saying that it equals to a net profit after tax no that is not true b retain any retain earnings is derived or obtained where we take into account the interest and then tax that's where we get retained and even take into account preference or dividend i mean dividend when we take dividend also from it that's where we get retain earnings so retain earnings arrive by taking into account your interest and your tax and then dividend so that is not true and then income net income available to professional shareholders so this one is also not true so the right answer is net operating income that is earnings before interest and what tax so once you see ebit you're talking about earnings before interest and tax so the right answer is what d that is question 26 i hope you are getting what i'm teaching you good so if you are getting a smart like button and then let's take it from there thank you question 27 let's go this refers to the speed and ease with which an asset can be converted to cash this refers to the speed and ease with which an asset can be converted to cash so which of them is the right answer convertibility liquidity transferability marketability convertibility liquidity transferability and so which of them so here once you are you heard of the speed and ease we are talking about liquidity the ease with which an asset can be converted to cash quickly that is liquidity so let's take note of that let's take marketability you're talking about the ease with it an asset can be what sold and bought is that okay that is marketability but here we are talking about what liquidity so let's take note of that now let's move on to question 28 pecking order theory suggests which of the following Okay, when it comes to pecking order theory, it was a theory or model that was developed by two known popular gurus in finance, okay, called Stewart Mills, Stewart, Stewart Miles, Stewart Miles, and Nicholas, Nicholas Maljuluf. These are the two people who came out with the pecking order theory in the year 1984 in the year 1984 and they stated that when it comes to capital structure decision okay pecking order theory from Stewart Miles and Nicholas Holt, Marluf, Marluf, they are saying that when it comes to capital structure decision when it comes to the sources of finance for the operations of the business companies and entities place much priority to their source of income 
Get it right. Pecking order theory suggests that when it comes to capital strategy decision, okay, companies place priorities to the source of finance they should use to finance its operations. And so therefore, they place high premium on internal source of what financing. On internal source of what financing. The reason why they place much premium on internal source of financing is because of what we call information asymmetry. It's what because of what we call an information asymmetry. We realize that this order pecking order theory was developed because of the information asymmetry. When talking about information asymmetry, we are talking about a platform where or a system that I mean actually give a platform for people to or for a group of people to have access to information and use those information for their, their advantage to the detriment of what other parties. Get it right. Information asymmetry, we are talking about what a system that creates a platform where a group of people is able to obtain information and use those information for their own advantage to the detriment of what other parties. So here, when it comes to business entities, when it comes to company, we realize that at any time a business is registered, it obtains a legal personal legal personality, okay? And so therefore, ownership and control becomes what two sides of what different coin. I mean they are not the same. The one who controls the affairs of the business differ from the one who owns the business. So realize that the controllers of the business have access to greater information as compared to those who own the business. First, those, those that control are those that know the performance of the company, they know what the company is going to achieve in the long term round, they know the future prospects of the company and a lot. Because of this information, that is why Pecking Order Theory came to reduce this information asymmetry that managers have as against what shareholders and other owners of for the business. So Pecking Order Theory saying that for us to reduce information asymmetry and when it comes to capital structure decision, we won't take into account, we will take into, we will take into account sources from what internal i mean internal sources internal source like what retain earnings that's what we're going to use to finance the operation of the business as a first priority okay and if the internal source of finance is not available that is where we engage on with what the external what source of finance and with the external source of finance the next priority that an entity plays on is what debt finance debt finance debt finance and the last Thing that they will resort to if internal finance, internal fund and debt finance are not available, so what we call equity finance. So pecking order theory was actually developed to reduce what we call information asymmetry because if managers are allowed to do, I mean to work on their own without any consultation from the owners of the business, they will engage in activity that will result in their own value maximization, that is profit maximization, as against the worth maximization of what shareholders because of this information that they have and they're going to use the information for their own detriment so when it comes to capital strategy decision pecking order theory is saying that hey managers will or sorry the entity will place much premium on internal fund to finance the operations of the business as against debt and equity but then if internal funds not available then equity will follow suit and if equity is not available, sorry, debt will follow suit, and if debt is not available, that's where equity will come in. So, pecking order theory was actually developed to reduce what we call information asymmetry, and in so in so doing, priority are placed on how or on which source of finance should the business use when it comes to capital strategy decision, and so therefore, internal source of finance is preferred more than debt finance and more and debt finance also prefer more than what the equity finance so they follow in that logic so here you can clearly see that the answer is option what d so let's take note of that internal capital is preferred to debt which is preferred to what external funds so external funds here and equity so let's take it so that is the whole issue in relation to pecking or that theory pecking or that theory. So, Let's take note of that. And we'll do it by Stewart 
Miles and Nicholas Marf Marge Luf, sorry, in 1984. So that is that. That is that. So let's take note of that. Now let's move on to the last two sets of our questions. We are to use the information to answer question 29 and 30. Now, you are given the following information about two companies, both entirely financed by what? Equity. So we have X dividend, total current dividend, total dividend five years ago, and the total number of shares. 29. The question is the dividend per share of Anaco Limited is the dividend per share of Anaco Limited. So to find the dividend per share, it is the current dividend, okay, divided by the total number of outstanding shares. The current dividend, okay, divided by the total number of outstanding. So here, it is our total current dividend divided by the total number of outstanding shares. So in this case, we want to know the dividend per share for Anaco Limited is going to be my current dividend, which is what? 6,158 divided by 120,000. That's an outstanding shares. And at the end of the day, you should be able to arrive at with my calculator, I had the dividend per share to be 0 0.05. That's when I converted to decimal place, 0 0.05. So that is my dividend per share. Now, let's move on to the growth in dividend for ISA Co Limited. When it comes to growth of dividend, most of present as what? Small g. It has a number of formulas that we actually use to compute it. So, depends on the information you're going to be giving, will determine the formula you're going to what, use to compute it. So, in this case here, since we are giving what? A current dividend, and we're giving dividend that we paid five years ago, this is what we're going to do. The formula for this formation is going to be so, growth is going to be the end fruit of. Our current total current dividend, total current dividend divided by total dividend in in past, I mean total dividend in past years or in previous years, okay, minus one, all multiplied by what hundred. So I don't know if we need to convert it. So this is a formula you're going to use to compute for the growth in dividend. How well dividend has grown from that five years till now i mean you want to know the percentage rate so in this case i know my total current dividend is what for isa is what so the end fruit is what i mean the end is what five years so from five years to now so it's going to be five that's end fruit five or oh, let me let me write it all for you so it's going to be five then you're going to have here to be 48,130 divided by my dividend in the past past five years is going to be 37,600 right minus one and we multiply by what 100 so with my case i had so i had my final answer to be to be 5.06 if i had to convert to this man 5.06 percent and that becomes my the rate at which my dividend has grown from five years to what now so that is with the growth in dividend that is with the growth in dividend you might see with other formulas like like to calculate the growth rate of dividend you might see that it added in other books you might see this formula d n over d zero minus one meaning that current dividend over dividend in the past i mean dividend in one year past minus one and and this formula is used where you are given a table where we have what various what dividend i mean various growth of dividend from year one year two year three i mean the number of years are going to spread will determine we have this formula there to also to use but then because of the information that we are giving, that's why we use this formula. So let's take note of that. So this is where we bring an end to our 
present if this video was helpful to you please go ahead to like subscribe and share please like subscribe and share please like subscribe and share i'll see you bye bye